You pay militaries that normally do things like this, to fight what we thought was a coalition or an anti-coalition force. We try to maintain a secure environment, but look at all these other things. And as we start and we think about the role of the military and the role of NGOs, you'll see how important it is as we go on and we talk about the different things that this division did over 12 months. You'll see that, that it's not the military alone, and we cannot operate in an environment where there is a firewall built between us and our other organizational groups, such as NGOs. U.S. Brigadier General Jeffrey Schlosser spoke more of pacification and security and reinforced his message with a short video presentation put together by two soldiers of the 101st Airborne Division in Iraq. What struck me most, uh, listening to both of you and watching the video, was the enormous difference in culture. Uh, and not simply uh, watching the soldiers, I think as much as anything, listening to the music uh, and thinking that that is the music, uh, it's, an, it's American rock music. Uh, and it is uh, global, of course, in many ways. But the lyrics uh, and indeed the, the rhythms are of a particular culture. We heard this morning that one role non-governmental organizations can play is to bridge cultures, uh, that they are uh, the independent entities that can operate between the space uh, of, the, of the government officials, be they soldiers or, or non-military officials, uh, and uh, a society. And so one question I would put to both of our speakers uh, is whether what they think of that proposition, whether there are non-governmental organizations who can fill the space uh, between the soldiers coming in and beginning to set up uh, a government uh, and a, a democratic civil society and, uh, and government of the kind that the ambassador was discussing. Can NGOs bridge the gap? Um, in fact, they are best suited uh, to filling that gap because, and that goes back to the cultural issue, because in fact, you not only have an American versus an, an, a Muslim, Arab, or Kurdish culture, you also have a military culture versus a civilian culture. And I think that is even greater than the Western versus Middle Eastern. Um, and it's, I think it's the military culture that has been the most difficult uh, for Iraqis to accommodate themselves to. Now, I know we saw some um, very heartwarming pictures, and it's not to say that I haven't seen them myself uh, in Baghdad and other places in, in uh, central Iraq, but I have also seen uh, a clash of friction between what a soldier thinks is perfectly normal procedure and what an Iraqi civilian regards as overstepping the bounds and so on. NGOs bridging the gap between the military and the civilian. That is a really a very difficult question because it gets to the heart of the matter about how close can an NGO get to a military organization without losing its independence and then therefore becoming, in some cases, a target. And, I, and again, I was just going to go back to the point, though, that if you are in an NGO and you think that you are not a target to a guerrilla who wants to demonstrate that a coalition cannot maintain security or that an Iraqi security organization cannot maintain security, you're kidding yourself. The dangers are real. Just days before coming to Princeton, Denis Dragovich, who is the country director of the International Rescue Committee in Iraq, was negotiating the release of a kidnapped aid worker. The thing is, with, with situations such as in Iraq, you don't know how close you get. Uh, you don't know how, how far the front right wheel missed an explosive device. You don't know how far... Um, or, or how close someone has decided not to shoot a Jew but instead to wait for the next person going by. You don't know these things. It seems to me that somewhere along the line that people don't have a clear understanding of the role and the unique nature of NGOs. And not surprisingly so considering what's going on in Iraq at the moment. On one side we have US military personnel parading in, in, in certain times in civilian clothes driving white 4x4s and even driving civilian vehicles. 
We have uh, civilian aid workers uh, wearing Department of Defence IDs, surrounded by armed security guards. The media, meanwhile, refer to soldiers and armed security personnel killed in action as humanitarians. And NGOs themselves, in some cases, request and accept military escorts or contracts from the Department of Defence. It's very confusing to me to be able to distinguish between NGOs uh, and it's understandably even more confusing for Iraqis who haven't had an experience with the international humanitarian community and the unique independence of NGOs.